Turn on my two five left, correct to line number two, following Tempe Heavy Airbus Free and Mile Farm. Okay, number two. What's going on guys, Flyby Simulations here, and welcome to what is probably one of the most anticipated videos in this Zebo 737 aircraft's dissected series, which is of course, the landing. So in the previous episode, we covered the descent planning and initial approach phase of flight, and in this episode, the main highlights, as you can probably tell from the title and thumbnail of this video, are going to be to take a look at the entire descent and landing phases of flight through live commentary. So, without further ado, let's jump into the flight deck and pick up where we left off. Alright ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the flight deck of the Boeing 737-800, and also consequently to the live commentary portion of this aircraft's dissected series where we're going to walk you through the entire landing, descent and approach procedure into KLAX. So as you can see, we have left off exactly where the previous episode was left off, uh, maybe a little bit before to be able to give you guys a better understanding of, few of uh, a few procedures that were rushed through in the previous episode. So we're descending through 24,000 feet, just there as you can see on the primary flight display. Our speed that we're trying to maintain at the moment is going to be 285 knots. So as you can see, we are descending through our altitude checkpoints mentioned in the previous episode. So from 35,000 feet, we are now currently descending to 18,000 feet, following which we will be continuing our descent towards 10,000 feet, and then following that, we will be following various speed and altitude constraints to eventually get down to 1,900 feet, which is our glide slope capture altitude for runway 25 left for an ILS landing at KLAX. Now, if that all sounds very complicated, I highly recommend you guys go ahead and check out the previous episode. If not in the entire aircraft dissected series, at least check out the entire full flight portion where we start this aircraft from a cold and dark state, uh, do a taxi procedure, takeoff procedure, climb and cruise, as well as the initial descent planning in the previous episode. With that all said, I'd like to bring your attention to a new concept that I'd like to introduce to you guys on the ND here, which is this green arc. Now what this green arc technically means, and we will be using this quite, quite a lot in the descent procedure, is the exact point in our route, visually speaking on this ND, that we will be reaching our altitude that has been plugged into the MCP or mode control panel. So in this case we have 18,000 feet plugged into the mode control panel. So this green arc represents that at the current rate of descent we're following right now, which as you can see over here is 2100 feet per minute, we're, we're going to be reaching 18,000 feet right before hitting this Foxtrot India Microwave Point, or FIM. So that's what it's supposed to represent. As we start dialing the altitude back on uh, the mode control panel and down to 10,000 feet, you will see this green arc shifting. And that's a good way for all of you newbies and beginners to be able to judge um, the specific altitudes at which you want to be at these waypoints, so that you can follow your route. That's just a little bit of trivia I wanted to give you guys. So at 18,000 feet, we're also going to be, uh, if you guys remember, in the United States, 18,000 feet also happens to be our transition level, where we switch from the um, standard altimeter pressure or barometric pressure down to the local altimeter setting. So at the moment, we have, we're on standard barometric pressure. However, we have pre-selected the local altimeter setting, which is 29.94 inches of mercury, and we will be selecting that momentarily. So 18,400 feet, we're pretty close to the transition level, so I'm going to go ahead and select the local barometric pressure now. There we go, 29.94 inches of mercury is now active. And there we go, we have now, now dialed in the lower altitude on the mode control panel, which is 10,000 feet in this case, to be able to smoothly continue our descent and get down to the next altitude checkpoint. So as you can see, the engines are spooling down, and we have continued or commenced our descent again. Again, keep an eye on that green arc if you're a beginner. In fact, even if you're an intermediate or veteran uh, Boeing 737-800 pilot, it's always good to have a visual reference as to when you're going to be reaching the altitude that you, that you have entered into your mode control panel. So we're going to be reaching 10,000 feet right before hitting this bayest waypoint. If I remove uh, some clutter from the, from the navigation display, as you can see, Bayest is this star right here, waypoint, and we're going to be getting to 10,000 feet right about there. And the descent looks all good. Alright, ladies and gentlemen, so we're a little bit further in the descent. We're now down to 14,600 feet, 
And as you can see, if you guys might remember from episode 13 of this series, uh, we have a hard speed and altitude constraint at 10,000 feet where we're supposed to be at or below 250 knots. So the aircraft is now momentarily suspending its high rate of descent and is trying to keep the no pitch of the no uh, nose of the, sorry, the pitch up of the aircraft so that it can hit the 250 knot magic number. And there we go. Now that we're close to that number, the aircraft is now beginning to increase its vertical speed and re reintroduce the uh, high rate of descent so we can get to the specific waypoints in our route at the perfect time. So as we start turning towards our next waypoint, I'm going to bring the navigation display, uh, zoom in on the navigation display using the range selector knob over here on the EFIS panel. And we're getting pretty close to the 10,000 feet uh, altitude checkpoint we have set here. Now at this point, I'd also like to remind you guys to always uh, be in the good habit of uh, keeping your heading bug uh, on the mode control panel synced with the, um, with the navigation display. So currently our track is moving, so we're taking that left turn towards, uh, towards uh, the parallel approach towards runway 25 left. And as soon as we complete this turn, I will try to sync up the heading bug with the track of the aircraft. Uh, as well as that, now that we are at 11,600 feet, it's time to plug in a lower altitude on the mode control panel. And the specific altitude that we're going to be choosing uh, to incrementally descend down to 1,900 feet eventually is going to be 7,000 feet. And the place where I got that magic number actually happens to be the CDU. So once we come down to the CDU, simply go ahead and press this legs page button and as you might remember, here's where you can find the specific waypoints, their headings, uh, the specific uh, speed and altitude constraints at various waypoints and stuff like that. So after this bayest waypoint where we're supposed to be at 240 knots uh, at uh, 10,558 feet of altitude, there we go, the next one, the purple one, we're supposed to be at 240 knots and above 7,000 feet. So that's where I got the 7,000 feet number. 7,000 feet is the specific way, uh, specific altitude that that waypoint requires us to be at. So I just dialed in 7,000 feet so the aircraft knows that it's clear to descend to that altitude. And there we go. Now that we're traveling in a straight line, sync up the heading bug by using the heading, dis uh, heading control panel on the mode control panel. And as you can see, that dotted line on the navigation display is now 084 degrees, as mentioned on the track. So the track as well as the heading should always be aligned. And there we go. Now the aircraft is descending down to the 240 knot specification that has been dialed into the flight management computer. There we go. And we have continuing, we are continuing our descent to 7,000 feet. Also, now that we have passed 10,000 feet, we're going to go ahead and uh, complete a few actions on our procedure checklist. So the first thing would be to turn on both the fixed as well as the runway turnoff lights. If you're flying at night, I also urge you to turn on the logo light as well as the wing light over here. Here's a better visual representation of the lights I'm talking about. So this is the logo light and this is the wing light. And we have just turned on the fixed landing lights as well as the, as well as the runway turnoff lights. That's about that for the 10,000 feet procedure. And we continue to descend smoothly through 8,500 feet. All right, ladies and gentlemen, in a few moments, we'll be switching the LNAV and VNAV modes off and use the heading select modes to control our heading, as well as the individual altitude, speed, and vertical speed knobs on the MCP to control our descent towards the start of our approach procedure towards runway 25 left at LA. We do this, first of all, in order to have more granular control over our entire approach towards the airport, but more importantly, to be able to show you how to operate the other knobs on the MCP panel comfortably. As we go along, everything will be explained systematically through the live commentary, but just wanted to give you guys a heads up as to what to look out for as we continue our descent. All right, so as you, can, as, as you guys can see, I'm sorry about that, we're turning uh, to our final uh, parallel sort of um, path from the runway. So as you can see on the navigation display right here, here's the runway, runway 25 left, as it says right here. And we're going to pa travel parallel to that runway. And when we get uh, right perpendicular to this Honda waypoint, we're going to make a turn uh, twice. So one right turn to move towards Honda, and then another right turn to then start coming back towards runway 25 left. 
So now that we're moving through 7,000 feet, we have a 3,600 feet constraint at Honda. So we're going to dial our altitude back again so the aircraft knows that it's clear to descend through that altitude. At this point, I'm also going to take control away from LNAV and VNAV, and we're going to manually uh, plan our descent. So LNAV is off, VNAV is off, and we're going to sync the heading bugs. Heading select is on, so now the aircraft is following the heading that we have inputted into the mode control panel. We're also going to turn on the vertical speed mode so that we can control our rate of descent. So I'm going to put a vertical speed. Again, I'm using this um, green arc as a visual measure of when we should get to 3,600 feet. So a 1,400 feet per minute rate of descent should get us um, to 3,600 feet as we are perpendicular to the Honda waypoint right here. I hope that makes sense. We're also going to start dialing our speed down. Uh, as you can see on the CDU, at the Honda waypoint, we should be at 193 knots and below 3,600 feet. The B following the numbers right here on the altitude signify if it's below. If it said A, then it would be above. So right now we're supposed to be 193 knots and 3,600 feet or below at Honda. So 210 knots is a good speed to have and we can incrementally start slowing down. Now with the particular rate of descent that we have dialed into our um, into the aircraft and we're asking it to achieve, it's kind of unrealistic. So what we're going to do is we're also going to use these speed brakes to be able to give ourselves some extra drag which will help slow the aircraft down. As you can see the speed is slowly starting to crawl backwards. Keep in mind this is again 8th grade, 10th grade physics that if you induce drag while traveling in a straight vectored line you're also going to be losing altitude. So you have the added um, descent as well from the uh, wing spoilers that we've just deployed over the wings. So descending nicely through 4,800 feet as we speak and our speeds also coming down very nicely. There we go. We're now officially under the cloud ceiling that was enveloping KLAX from being seen. And we're going to be taking our right turn momentarily. So we're 3,800 feet at the moment. And as you can see, we are heading select mode activated. So as soon as we start spinning this knob over here, you're going to see the dotted line move. And we're going to start turning the aircraft. So 070, let's self vector ourselves for the base leg right turn. So let's start turning the aircraft. There we go. And we're turning ourselves completely. We're doing a 90 degree right turn, as you can see. And since we're at 210 knots here, we're also going to redeploy, uh, re retract the speed brakes as we no longer need it. There we go. We can also continue reducing our speed now down to 193 knots, which if you remember was the specific speed um, we were supposed to be at at this, at the Honda waypoint. There we go. All right, ladies and gentlemen, so as we start making our right base leg turn towards the Honda waypoint, I'd like to bring your attention to these two hollow diamonds on the PFD, which represent the localizer as well as the glide slope components of the ILS beacon, which we will be using to make a precision landing on runway 25 left at LA. As you can see, currently both diamonds are hollow which means that the aircraft has detected the presence of a localizer and a glide slope beacon, but hasn't established itself onto either of them. As we move further into our turn though, first you'll see this localizer diamond at the bottom go from being hollow to filled in pink, signifying that the aircraft is ready to capture it in order to get perfectly aligned with the center line of the runway and give us lateral guidance towards the runway. As for the other hollow diamond on the right of the artificial horizon here, that will come alive a little further in the approach, as we continue descending to our glide slope capture altitude of 1,900 feet. If you remember from the previous episode, we are supposed to intercept the glide slope component at 1,900 feet when we get to this Lima waypoint. So when the glide slope diamond gets filled in pink, we will wait for the diamond to start coming down on the scale ID enunciator, following which we will retract the flaps all the way to 15 degrees and also extend the landing gear. As the glide slope diamond continues to come down, we will eventually go ahead and press this approach button on the MCP, which will fully establish us on the localizer as well as the glide slope for an ILS landing into runway 25 left. So just as a recap, as we continue our turn, the hollow localizer diamond at the bottom will become fully pink. Then, once we're aligned with the center line, as we continue to descend, 
Eventually, the glide slope diamond will also fill up. So we'll take flap 15 and gear down when the diamond begins to come down, and we'll also arm the approach mode on the MCP. Capiche? Alright, let's go ahead and resume the simulation. And we're maintaining 193 knots. And we're going to be taking another right turn. Also, as we're below 200 feet, it's also the right time to start uh, extending some flaps so that we can start flying at lower speeds. So we're going to go ahead and extend flaps to all the way to 5 degrees. And the way you can see when to extend the flaps is actually this little placard under the landing gear right here. So you can see the specific flap limitations in indicated airspeed for all the flap positions, all the way up to flap 40. There you go. The aircraft is using the trim wheel to be able to maintain our altitude as well as speed. It's doing just fine at the moment. Very good. Okay, and we're going to start turning right again. Back towards the Honda waypoint. And this is going to allow the localizer in the aircraft to be able to capture uh, the specific ILS beacon at runway 25 left. So that then the localizer can handle all of the lateral component of the aircraft while we come in uh, to runway 25 left. It's, it's okay to overshoot the localizer intercept. As you can see, we flew above that straight line. Uh, past that straight line, we're coming back now. So that's perfectly fine. It's okay, if, especially if you're a beginner or if you're trying to create a very complicated video trying to explain to people how to fly an aircraft. That is, you're allowed to make a few mistakes. There we go. And as you can see, we have the glide, uh, the localizer diamond active over here. So that's perfectly fine. And as we get closer to the localizer diamond, I'm going to dial back the range a little bit. We also have the glide slope diamond moving down. So we're going to Further decrease our speed down to 180 knots at this point. Take flap 15, and we can take the landing gear down as well. Like to be nice and prepared early on. And at this time, we can also arm the approach mode. There we go, approach mode armed. And as you can see, the aircraft has now intercepted both the localizer as well as the glide slope as both of these diamonds on the scale ID enunciators are filled in pink completely. So now both the lateral as well as vertical components of the aircraft are completely established with the ILS beacon. At this point we can do a few other things to be prepared for the landing. As you can see the runway is right in front of us over there. That is runway 25 left and three guesses for what runway that is. There you go, <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure you guessed it. It's runway 25 right, that is runway 25 right. And you have the beautiful city of uh, Los Angeles right down below us. And 180 knots is what we're maintaining at the moment. Now that we're also established on the ILS as well as the localizer, we can go ahead and uh, set the missed approach information into the mode control panel. So if you remember, our missed approach Okay, so our missed approach heading was 251 degrees, which happens to be our runway heading. And our missed approach altitude is supposed to be 2,000 feet. So we're going to dial both of those in. Just as practice, in case we ever have to perform a go-around, we could use that. Alright, ladies and gentlemen, as we make our final turn and get onto short final for runway 25 left, I also want to introduce a new indication to look out for, which are the PAPI lights. Now, for those of you who don't know, Pappy in aviation is not the Spanish word for dad, but instead stands for Precision Approach Path Indicator, which are a set of four lights which shine either a red or white light depending on the angle at which you view them during your descent. Normally, these Pappy lights are used to stay on the correct glide path during the approach towards the runway. As you can see on screen right now, if you see two red lights and two white lights, that means you're on the perfect glide path and will be landing in the touchdown zone of the runway. If you have more red lights than white lights, for example, three red lights and one white light, that is an indication that you're too low and must maintain your altitude and speed to be able to rejoin the glide path. Similarly, if you have more white lights than red lights, that is an indication that you're too high, so you need to reduce your speed and lose some altitude to be able to again rejoin the glide path. As the saying goes, red on red, you're dead, meaning you're too low. White on white, check your height, meaning of course that you're too high. Finally, you also have red on white, you're alright, meaning that you're on the right glide path for the approach. Alright, so I hope that made sense to you, so be sure to look out for those pappy lights in the distance. I will mention them in the live commentary, but again, just wanted to explain some theory and give you guys a heads up as to what to look out for during this phase of flight. 
So, let's get back to the sim. And we can continue dialing our speed back. Now we're going to dial our speed back to 160 knots. If you remember from previous uh, from the previous episode, I should say, our approach speed, our final approach speed, uh, was 145 knots. So eventually we're going to set the IAS Mach number over here on the mode control panel to 145 knots, and we're going to come in for a smooth landing. With that done, let's get some more external lights. So coming up to the overhead panel, we're also going to go ahead and turn on the retractable landing lights. We're going to go ahead and uh, turn the engine start switches to the continuous position, just like we did for the takeoff, as this is also considered a critical phase of flight. We're also going to go ahead and arm the speed brakes, so set the speed brakes one notch up to the armed position. This will be confirmed, as you can see over here. Uh, speed brake armed is enunciated above the navigation display, and that shows that the ground spoilers are ready to... Um, deploy as soon as we land, as soon as the uh, main landing gear of the aircraft touches down. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're now on final approach, and I'll take this time to give you guys a few rough tips regarding landing. I'll try to keep this section short, as I want to make a full-fledged comprehensive landing technique video on the 737-800 later down the line. This little segment is just to show what to do and what not to do while performing a standard ILS landing in the Zeebo 737. First things first, now that we are established on the localizer and glide slope, and also have a visual reference to the runway, we'll be disconnecting the autopilot as well as the auto throttle and manually fly the aircraft down to the ground. During this process, keep a close eye on the pappy lights while descending. As you get to below 300 feet or so, you want to generally start ignoring the pappy lights and completely focus your attention on the touchdown zone, which are these piano tile markings on the runway you're seeing right now. Aircraft will usually touch down right in front of these piano tiles, and a good way to know the touchdown zone is to look at the black skid marks on the runway. As you continue your descent and pass the runway threshold, it's important that you switch your focus from the piano tiles to the opposite end of the runway, as you're going to want a better frame of reference in front of you to gently flare the aircraft in a bit. For those of you who don't know, Flaring is the process of slowly pitching the aircraft's nose up right before touchdown so that it lands on its main landing gear first. As you begin to descend below 100 feet, the ground proximity warning system within the plane will begin counting down your altitude in lower increments of 10 feet, starting from 50 feet, so 50, 40, 30, 20, and so on. So at 30 feet, you should completely retract the thrust levers and gently begin the flare up to around 2.5 to 5 degrees on the artificial horizon. Again, like most things, this is normally a feeling you need to have as a pilot to have a smooth yet firm touchdown and will normally come with practice. As soon as we touch down, we'll go ahead and deploy the reverse thrust so you'll hear the engine spooling back up at idle reverse thrust to allow us to slow down in conjunction with the auto brake and the wing spoilers. And that should be enough for you guys to get a brief picture of what to look out for during the landing sequence. Let's switch back to live commentary and actually watch the landing now. 1000 feet, and we're looking at the runway right there. Right now the air autopilot is controlling everything. Uh, normally I would like to, I, I normally disengage the air autopilot systems at 1500 feet and land the aircraft, but for the instructional purposes of this episode, uh, I'm going to keep the autopilot running. Right about now, actually, I'm going to go ahead and disconnect it. So I'm going to dial our speed all the way back to 145 knots. Take flap 40, which is our final flap position. Uh, in, to be honest, it should have been done a little bit earlier, the flap, or tra uh, flap extension procedure. However, I was trying to explain a few things. There we go, 560 feet. Should be coming up to 500 feet momentarily. 500. There we go, 500 feet. And we can go ahead and disconnect the autopilot and the auto throttle system. There we go. My aircraft. Now I'm completely flying the aircraft. Uh, make sure to not put too much pressure on the aircraft systems. Um, try to keep the aircraft Three level. Approaching minimums. Now I did increase the speed there quite a little bit. That was my fault. Two the Zebo 737 minimums. does have bugs sometimes. Make sure to hear the minimums. 100 feet coming down try to aim for the piano tiles as well as the 50, runway markings 50 40, feet 30, All right, that is retracted and flare the aircraft gently 
There we go. Smooth touchdown. Ground spoilers are coming on. We're also going to arm the reverse thrust. As you can see, the reverse is green on the upper display unit. And we're slowing down nice and easy. 80 knots. 70 knots. And reverse is off. Switching to manual braking. So just tap on the brakes and the auto brake system will automatically disarm. So you can now control the brakes. And now it's just like taxiing on the ground like we did before the takeoff procedure. So we're going to vacate the runway right here. This should be, I think, Hotel 9 or Hotel 8, if I'm not mistaken. And I will be pausing this video right after we vacate this runway. There we go. And hopefully you guys enjoyed that video. There's a lot to explain in a very little time. I'm just going to uh, stop the aircraft here. Um, yeah, so there's a lot to explain in very little time, but I, I hope I could cover everything. A few actions could have been done sooner, like the flap extension process could be done sooner. And if you guys are really looking to practice your landings in the Zebo 737, I highly recommend you don't stick with the autopilot for as long as I did there. That is completely for instructional purposes. I was trying to show you the capabilities of the aircraft while trying to perform a landing. However, I would highly recommend you to either perform traffic patterns with the aircraft, which I will be covering in a later video. It's a way to practice your takeoffs as well as landing. Uh, and uh, I would highly recommend you to disengage the autopilot around 1,500 to 1,700 feet. So you get a good taste of actually flying the aircraft with the autopilot to a certain altitude. And then you actually get to feel the wind. Uh, so to speak, and to be able to get the aircraft safely on the ground on your own merit as compared to the computers on board the aircraft doing it. So I hope you guys enjoyed, and let's cut to the conclusion. So, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of this aircraft's dissected episode, covering the final descent and landing into KLAX. Now, though it may seem like the end of this series, there's still one more episode left to go, where we cover the after-landing procedure and taxi back to the gate to disembark the passengers and officially conclude the flight. Again, just like the previous episode, I'll be keeping this conclusion short, as I want the transition from this episode to the next to be as seamless as possible. So if you guys enjoyed this video, make sure to perform a full stop landing at the like button and the subscribe button, and press the bell icon for future notifications from this channel. Also, be sure to fly by the comment section and let me know if there's any questions you'd like me to answer for you. As usual, thanks for flying by.